Okay, looks like we're live. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to another virtual event of the Boston Society of Washington, D.C. My name is Steve Dewey. I'm the chapter director for our Washington, D.C. chapter. The Boston Society is the public outreach program of the American Institute for Economic Research, otherwise known as AIER. We promote the principles of free market economics, sound money, limited government, personal liberty, and a free society. If you would like to learn more about AIER and the Boston Society, our website address is AIER.org. For our event today, I'm very honored and excited to have Steve Hankey as our featured speaker. He will be speaking on the, on the topic of COVID-19 lockdowns and their ratchet effect of increasing government control and their economic impact. Since the COVID-19 pandemic hit in the United States in March of 2020, federal and state governments have responded with varying levels of new and prolonged restrictions on human activity, as well as unprecedented deficit spending by the federal government and money creation by the Federal Reserve. Professor Hankey will examine the impact of the COVID-19 lockdowns across the United States over the past 15 months and how they have exacerbated the ratchet effect of ever increasing government activity and control over our lives. A little bit about Dr. Uh, Dr. Hankey. Um, I must say he has uh, just an incredible, incredibly impressive background. I'll just take a minute to uh, summarize, summarize very quickly his impressive back, background. He is a professor of applied economics and founder and co-director of the Institute for Applied Economics, Global Health, and the Study of Business Enterprise at the Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. He is also Senior Fellow and Director of the Troubled Currencies Project at the Cato Institute in Washington, DC. He's also a Senior Advisor at the Renmin University of China's International Monetary Research Institute in Beijing. He's a Special Counselor to the Center for Financial Stability in New York a contributing editor to, at Central Banking in London and a contributor at the National, National Review. Uh, Professor Anke is also a member of the Charter Council of the Society of Economic Measurement and of Euro Money Country Risks Experts Panel. Professor Hankey served as a senior economist on President Ronald Reagan Reagan's Council of Economic Advisors from 1981 to 1982, and a senior advisor to the Joint Economic Committee of the U.S. Congress from 1984 to 1988. He's been an advisor to five foreign heads of state and five foreign cabinet ministers, ministers and held a cabinet level rank in both Lithuania and Montenegro. He has been awarded seven honorary doctorate degrees and is an honorary professor at four foreign institutions. In 1988, he was named one of the 25 most influential people in the world by the World Trade Magazine. Professor Hankey, professor Hankey earned both his bachelor's degree and his PhD degree in economics from the University of Colorado. So before we get started, uh, with our discussion, please note that our event is scheduled for 75 minutes until 2.15 p.m. and we will reserve approximately 30 minutes at the end for a Q&A session with attendees. If you have a question that you would like to ask, please submit them using the Q&A button at the uh, bottom of the Zoom screen. So to start off the discussion, I would like to ask uh, Professor Hankey to comment on this concept of the ratchet effect, which basically means that whenever government imposes new temporary government powers to respond to an emergency, those temporary powers usually become permanent powers. So uh, Dr. Hanke, uh, please proceed with uh, your thoughts on the ratchet effect. Thank you, Steve, for that introduction. Uh, it's it's ob obviously a pleasure to be addressing the Bastiat Society. Bastiat being one of the one of the great Frenchmen uh, and classical liberals who could clearly see through things and uh, 
and, and you get to a, a punchy bottom line. Uh, he, he was, of course, the, the master of rhetoric and, and polemics. Uh, now, the ratchet effect has been around actually for quite some time, but the, the person who's done the most work on it in, in kind of the modern sense is Bob Higgs. Uh, uh, Higgs uh, has done a lot of work on it. And uh, actually, Bob and I even wrote a, a piece in the Financial Times on the ratchet effect years ago. Uh, the, the ratchet effect is, in, in simple terms, it, is the, the following. The, the government never lets any crisis go to waste. They, they always jump in and try to solve or uh, mitigate the crisis. And the problem is whatever they're doing, whether it works or not initially, it never goes away. So that's the ratchet. It, it, every single crisis stimulates the government entrepreneurial class and the political class to do what? Reach for the checkbook primarily and, and secondarily to institute new laws, invent new agencies, new bureaus and so forth to, to deal with whatever the impending or alleged crisis happens to be. And that these institutions as, as well as the checkbook tend to be permanent. And if you look at the, the current uh, administration, for example, uh, the, the first few months of the Biden administration, what, what have we had? We've had 1.9 trillion in COVID relief uh, that's been passed, by the way. Uh, Two point trillion proposed for so-called infrastructure programs, 1.8 trillion for family benefits, a, a total of $5.7 trillion. Now, the, the problem with this is if you look at it analytically, people say, well, five point trillion, you know, that's that's a that's a <laughs> that's really opening the checkbook. I mean, we've never seen anything like that to, to deal with a crisis before. But, but that's just the tip of the iceberg because those are really fake costs in a sense because to raise a dollar in tax revenue, it, it, there are costs associated with the raising of those funds. For one thing, you've, you've got two hidden costs and the hidden costs are one, the extraction cost associated with the, the, the IRS having to raise the, the revenues to, to fund those expenditures. And we, we know this is the case, by the way, because President Biden has already proposed that the budget of the IRS be increased by $80 billion so that they can, in fact, uh, pluck the goose and raise the revenue to fund these programs that he's proposing, these three big programs. Uh, so that's one cost, one hidden cost. The, the other hidden cost is the compliance cost associated with the taxpayers themselves who have to, at, at a minimum, fill out their, their tax forms and, and write a check to the government. But it's more than that because they have to, they hire lawyers, uh, they hire accountants, they, they spend a, a lot of their, their own time uh, getting their records in order and, 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 and in fact complying with the, with the tax laws. So if you look at those two hidden costs, that, that's about ranges from 10 to 25 cents per dollar of every tax dollar collected. But that's just the start of it. There's something called the excess burden and the excess burden is associated with the tax disincentives and distortions that are thrown into the economy because you're raising taxes at the margin. And as a result of that, national income it is in fact reduced. This is really an application of good old fashioned supply side economics. And, and those costs are very significant. The, the 
two studies that I, I like uh, that deal with excess burden are, one was done by Martin Feldstein, for late Martin Feldstein. The other was done by late Bill Niskan, and, and they come to about $3 excess burden or damage to the economy, if you will, associated with each additional dollar of tax revenue that, that uh, is raised. Now that puts us at, let's just say a rule of thumb would be $3. So for each dollar of tax revenue raised, in fact, you've got to multiply that by three to, to get the real cost associated with those government expenditures. So if we multiply the 5.7 trillion that have been proposed by Biden, what do we get? We get 17.1 trillion. So we're, we're talking about a big number. I mean, that, that's roughly 80% of last year's GDP. So the, the cost of these things, if you actually look at the hidden cost and excess burden, you're, you're up to you know, very big numbers. Uh, so, so that that's that's basically the the, the start of the ratchet, <laughs> and you're and, and and putting it in a in a contemporary setting, you, you see what what's involved. Now, these are not going to go away. By the way, once the government programs start, they they will continue churning away. And as Higgs has documented in some of his books many of the programs that were started in the Great Depression, and they were alleged to be temporary programs, we, we still have them. They're, they're all, none of them have gone away. I mean, you, you name one government program that, that's, that's axed, we're, we're not talking about a profit and loss system where, you know, I mean, uh, you start making buggy whips and the demand for buggy whips goes down and pretty soon the profits disappear and pretty soon the the manufacturers of buggy whips are, are long gone. That, that is not the case when you're dealing with the public sector and the government. I, I would add that uh, the, the cost uh, that, we've just, that I've just given you, jacking that 5.7 up to 17.1 trillion is probably a, a gross understatement because the infrastructure part of the program is usually associated with huge cost overruns. The, the studies that have been done on this indicate that the cost overruns for public infrastructure projects run about 50% to 100% over their advertised cost. So, so that's an, another uh, big increase. They're also plagued with huge delays. So, so again, in, in the public sector, you're dealing not in a private profit and loss setup, but you're dealing with, with something where they do a benefit cost study and they, they say, oh, the benefits are gonna be greater than the cost. The, number one, the benefit cost studies are, are usually tweaked and biased all over the place. But even assuming they were right, we don't know if they're right because there are no ex post studies of those government investments that have been made based and justified by a benefit cost study. So you do the benefit cost study, they say the benefits are greater than the cost. Well, if you multiply the cost by three, that excess burden aspect, you're, you're, you're gonna, I, I can't imagine that there are many government projects that actually would pass any kind of a benefit cost smell test but the big, the big problem is we don't even know how these things perform because we're not in a private business where at the end of the year, you know, either you've made a profit or a loss. And if you made the right choices, the right investments and deployed capital appropriately, you're gonna make a profit. If not, you're gonna make a loss. And if you make too many losses, you're out of there and, and long gone. So, so that's basically the, the about all I have to say initially, at least, about the uh, about the ratchet effect. Now you could say, well, if no projects are really justified, if you're multiplying the 
the cost of government spending by three to appropriately indicate the cost of raising government revenue. Uh, what what should the size that, that implies that the size of the government's way too big. And and if you go back, Milton Friedman used to always say that he thought the per, he'd be pretty comfortable if the size of the US federal government would was about 10 to 15% of GDP. And, and if you look at these numbers on excess burden and, and crank it out, and, and Bill Niskan actually has done this in, in one of his books, uh, one, one of the last books he wrote actually before he passed away, you, you end up with the op, the question is, well, what is the optimal size of the government given if you do the sharp pencil work that, that Niskanen's done, for example, on excess burden, well, it is about 10 or 15% of GDP for the size of the federal government. If the size of the federal government was, was 10 or 15% of GDP, believe me, the excess burden would, wouldn't be $3 for each dollar of tax revenue raised. It would be a lot less. And you would actually find at that, at that lower level of government activity, you probably would find things that could be justified on a benefit cost basis. So I think with that, Steve, I, I, I've probably said enough on, on, the, on the ratchet. And any, I would refer again to Higgs's work. Uh, that, that's the, the really gold standard when it comes to the ratchet effect. It's, he's he's a, one of the few economists who actually can write as well as Bastiat could write. So you, you can read it, understand what Higgs was talking about. Yeah, now the uh, Robert Higgs book, um that um, explained the ratchet effect. The title of that book is Crisis and the Leviathan. And correct me if I'm wrong, um, but uh, was, that, um, was that first published in the, like 1987? I, I can't really, really Steve, remember the publication date, Some, something like that. I mean, I have it over here. I could, I, on my bookshelf, I could run over and get it and tell you, but yeah. If you want me to, I will. Actually, I, I, it's literally right over. A, a three yeah, yeah, that's okay. yeah, no, that's okay. Um, but that's uh, just for the uh, benefit of our uh, attendees. That is the the title of the book that discusses the ratchet effect. It's it's entitled uh, "Crisis and the Leviathan" by Robert Higgs. Um, you you can get most of Higgs's works, by the way, the Independent Institute. Uh, in Oak, Oakland, California, uh, where Higgs was a senior fellow uh, and, and ed editor for many years of the Independent Review. Uh, just go to, go to the Independent Institute website. And you'll, you'll find uh, all this material. Mm, right. Um, so the, uh, the next thing I, I uh, wanted to get your, uh, your thoughts on is, um, is the... Federal Reserve's activities that uh, took place after the uh, pandemic hit, um, after the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, hit the United States in March of uh, 2020, it um, really uh, caused the Federal Reserve to launch into to, to really uh, unprecedented uh, activity. And, um, I was surprised to learn even just recently how many uh, funding facilities that they started, that they created as a, as a result of COVID-19. I thought it was like six or seven or eight new funding facilities. It was actually 13. <laughs> um, so um, um, that is really unprecedented. And that kind of ties in with this concept of the, of the ratchet effect where when there's an emergency, the, you know, the federal government just uh, creates this, um, creates this reaction to uh, an emergency. But I wonder if you could uh, talk a little bit about um, the Federal Reserve's actions uh, resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic, and in particular, the, um, the growth in the money supply. Uh, so as M2, the M2 money supply growth has been also unprecedented. Uh, I think from, for example, from March of, 2000, I think it was from April of 2020 to April of 2021, uh, M2 money supply growth is 24%, which I believe is unprecedented. Yeah, 
Yeah, Steve, um, I just stepped away. I was going to go to my desk and get some notes. Uh, but let me go through the, the Fed a, a little bit. Um, of course, the ratchet does come in here, and it's so obvious because the, the broadest measure of the money supply that the Fed provides is, is M2, uh, that, that money supply metric. Uh, if, if you want to get a better metric and, and broader uh, picture, go to the Center for Financial Stability because they have M4 and they have it in divisia terms. Uh, Professor Bill Barnett is a, a guru on this, and, and, and the, the, those are the best data, actually, the, the Center for Financial Stability. And a broad measure of money is the best measure of money if you're trying to chart the course of nominal GDP, which, of course, contains a real component and, a, and an inflation component. So, so we're back to the equation of exchange and monetarism and the equation of exchange M, the money supply, whatever measure you're using. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna talk, I'll, I'll talk in terms of M2 because it's easy to get and the, the Fed uh, produces that measure. So M times V, the velocity equals P times Y if you use the income form of the equation of exchange where where P is the price level and, and Y is real GDP. So what, what you've had is an explosion in, in M uh, as, and, and, and the ratchet, all, all these new programs and so forth. And, and it has been unprecedented. The last 17 months, the, the annual average rate of growth in, the, in M2 has been slightly over 20%. And which, which we haven't seen that since 1943. Uh, 1943, remember, we, were, we, we did have a crisis then. We were in World War II. So, so we, go, we go way back to see anything like this. It's really completely unprecedented. So if you look at the velocities and, and, uh, and, and the inflation target of the Fed is 2%, and you, you play around with the arithmetic, you, you end up with the what I call the golden growth rate for the money supply, if you wanted to hit the inflation target of 2% that the Fed has, they, they should have been growing the money supply at, at around 7%, 7 to 8%, let's just say roughly. So the, they've been growing it on an annual basis, not of 7 to 8% per annum, but a little over 20%. So we, you know, it's over, over, way over double the golden growth rate. So, so we know this is a, a, an unprecedented goosing of the money supply, a ratcheting up, if you will, of the money supply. Now, what, 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 what does that lead to? Well, it, the first thing that anyone that has studied Milton Friedman and knows monetarism and, and monetary economics, the first thing that happens with an ejection like that is that asset prices go up. Now, there's a lag of about one to six months. And so why have they gone up? Of course they've gone up. Look at the stock market. I mean, not today, but look at what, what's happened to the stock market. Look what's happened to housing prices. Look, look what's happened to other real asset prices. They, they, they've gone zooming up. Then the next thing that occurs, the next stage after the injection, the next, with a, again with a lag of, 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 of you know six six to twelve months, is, is the real economy starts cranking up. So look at the real economy now. The the Atlanta Fed, which has a pretty accurate and good record for and technique for estimating real growth. They're, they're indicating that in the second quarter, it, given the second quarter data, that we're going to be growing in real terms 10.5%. I mean, this is almost unprecedented. <laughs> so the real economy has really taken off. And if you look at like retail sales, uh, retail sales are on a, on a 
the last three months, the data indicate that on an annualized basis, the last three months, uh, you've had like a 50.5% increase in retail sales and sales for uh, food, food services. So that you just never seen numbers like that. I mean, they're just, they're just uh, to the moon almost. And, and the last thing that happens with a lag of about 12 to 24 months is that actual real inflation sets in. So at present, the Fed is trying to manage our inflation expectations and they say keep them anchored. And they do that by saying, well, the recent numbers we've seen, are there, it's just a transitory effect. They're, they're gonna be going away pretty soon and, and we'll, we'll, inflation will come down and we'll be meeting our target and everything. Well, if you look at the, use a monetarist model for national income determination, it's not going away. It's actually gonna be coming. So in 2022, you'll have, I think, you'll end up with inflation a little under 5% per annum using the monetarist model. And in 23 and 24, you'll have it a little under 6% at, at least. And, and that's all baked in the cake because we, we already know that for 17 months, we've had this extraordinary increase in a money supply measured by M2 of over 20%. So, so this is all, it's just arithmetic. I mean, it's, it's, it's there's a, all, all the debate in the paper and everything is essentially irrelevant because uh, my 95% rule, remember, holds, and that is 95% of what you read in the financial press is either wrong or irrelevant. And, and the, the temporary thing, there, there is a temporary aspect, by the way. And they, there are two things going on. They say, well, there's this base effect. A year ago, the, the inflation had, had been you know, re really punched down and, 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 the, and the price indices were very low. So any calculation you make today about year over year increases or changes in, the, in prices will, will be distorted because of this base effect. They'll, they'll, be, they'll be by, you know, just, just do the arithmetic and you, you, you operate off an artificially low base and you get an artificially high, high percentage change. It's true, it, it, that, that base effect will be gone in another two months, by the way. So that, that, that is a transitory thing. There is another transitory aspect and that is the real economy, as I indicated after this monetary goosing, the, the real economy is, is roaring now in, in terms of demand. The demand is, is huge right now for most things. And due to COVID disruptions and logistical problems and supply chains and whatnot, the, the startup on the supply side is lagged in some sectors. And as a result of that, if, if demand is going to the moon and supply is lagging, well, you have something called supply and demand curves and where they cross, they will cross at a higher price than they, they would have if supply would have been flexible and, and been able to accommodate the, the big surge in demand. But that, that, will, that will settle down too. So, so the Fed does have an argument. The Keynesians who all use, they latch on to this transitory thing. They, there's something to it, but behind it, we're, we're going to have a, a, a huge wall of inflation uh, that's stimulated and, 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 and in the pipeline because of this monetary injection we've seen. And, and that's, that's been, again, if, to use our theme of the day, it's, it's been ratcheted up. Uh, now the Fed, by the way, the Fed, won't be quite like government spending. The government spending will be a ratchet, but, but the Fed will, will ultimately pivot and, and start tightening up. So that, so that won't be, we're, we're permanently not gonna see the Fed. We're, we're not in Venezuela or, or Zimbabwe or someplace where, where in fact you had monetary ratchets and, and as a result, you've had in 62 cases in world history where you've had hyperinflation. So the monthly inflation has been over 
that's only happened 62, per, 62 times in, in world history that we've had episodes of hyperinflation. Now, uh, that is where you get a ratchet in the money supply, by the way. That, so those are very, very unusual. The, the money supply usually do, doesn't end up ratcheting up uh, as, as government expenditures do. So government expenditures adhere to the ratchet, but, but the monetary policy usually does not. It's very rare that it does. Uh, I have a, a follow-up question on the um, the M4 money supply that you mentioned. You mentioned the Center for Financial Stability that you use. You look at their data rather than the Fed's data. Is there a reason you look at the Center for Financial Stability data? And well, where, where do they get their yeah. data? Well, there, there are two reasons. One, one, the overarching reason is that the quality of the data is just much better. And, and quite frankly, I, I, uh, Professor Barnett knows a lot more about this than anyone at the Fed. But, but beyond, beyond that, there are two technical reasons. There, the one, one is that M4 is a broader measure than M2. It includes more things. There, there are 10 things that are included in, in M4. And, and M2 is a much smaller coverage. So, so you want to include everything in your metric for money supply that has moneyness in it, that's close to money. Now, the, the, the second reason is that this, this is, aggregation theory is used in, in the numbers that come out of the Center for Financial Stability, this divisia aggregation. And that is all the 10 components in the money supply measure have weights associated with them. So currency is in there, currency receives 100% weight because it's money. I mean, you can use it instantly for a transaction. If you go way out to the last thing in M4 is our T-bills. Now, T-bills aren't exactly money, but they have, they have a lot of money that's associated with them, especially at very low interest rates. They're almost like money because you're indifferent. If you're not getting paid any interest on a T-bill, you, you, it's not very sticky in your pocket. And if you want to buy a house or something and you've got a bunch of T-bills, what do you do? You exchange those for, for, for US dollars and it either goes in, you're not going to get a, a, a huge pile of, of cash. You'll probably have most of it go into your checking account, which also receives you know, a hundred percent weight in terms of moneyness. So, so the divisia thing weighs the various components in, in there, and and it and it changes around. The weights change around depending on the the opportunity cost associated with switching out of whatever is the component into actual cash. So, if interest rates are real high, for example, like they were in the, in, in the, the late 70s and the early 1980s, that you end up with very high interest rates. And, and, and that means that money market funds and key bills and things like that don't have very much moneyness in them because they're sticky. You, you want to keep them in earning a high rate of interest and you're very reluctant to, to actually cash out of those things into greenbacks that you can actually spend on the store for transactions. So, so that's the basic idea. Now, now M2, all, all of the Fed things are not divisia. They have no weights whatsoever. They're what's called simple sum aggregations. You just add up whatever, whatever you add currency, you add demand deposits, you, you add whatever the components are and, and that's it. You, you don't weigh, weigh them in any way. So the, so the divisia it, it is a more sophisticated and, and much superior handle on this. If we go back, by the way, a, a great example of why you can get messed up with this, uh, Paul Volcker, when he was chairman of the Fed, of course, he came in as chairman in 1979. We had tremendous inflation and a very high nominal interest rates. And, and, and he latched on to the monetarist idea that I'm going to crush inflation and, I, and I'm going to do that by slowing down the rate of growth in the money supply. And they, they were looking at M2 at the time and, 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 and 
Volker thought that in fact, he had the golden growth rate just about right. And, and he was looking at the Fed's simple sum. But if you looked at the Vizia, which, which Barnett was calculating at the time, actually you ended up with the, the squeeze that Volcker was putting on was much more severe than actually he thought it was. Because if you looked at the Divisia numbers, they, they were crashing much more than the simple sum numbers. And the reason why they were crashing much more is, is this proper weighting due to interest rates and, and, and the very high interest rates on like money market funds and so forth. So, so he didn't have the right measure of money supply on a speedometer. That, that, and so that, that's why it's important for monetary policy purposes, you've got to have the right metric on your dashboard. And if you don't, you, you can make mistakes. So he had the right theory, the right principles Volcker did he didn't have the right measurement metrics on his dashboard. And as a result, remember, we had, we had two recessions in 1981 and 83 when he was putting the squeeze on. If he would have had the right metric on, we would have had um, may, maybe not even two recessions. And, and, and they would have been obviously much milder than, than what we experienced because he was stepping on the brakes a, a lot harder in reality than he thought he was. Okay, <laughs> good explanation. Very, uh, yeah. Um, yeah we, could, we could go on that much uh, in greater detail, but it's shifting over to fiscal policy. Uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, maybe a, a, a more important ratchet effect was really the fiscal policy, policy of the federal debt. So right now the US national debt is up to 20, somewhere around $28 trillion. And I believe I, I calculated that it's, um, I think it's over 120% of uh, GDP, which is even higher than what it was in 1945 at the end of World War II. So I was wondering if you could uh, maybe talk about, uh, you know, just this tremendous increase in our deficit spending in our national debt. Yeah, this, this gets a little bit into what I call lying prices, which goes back to the excess burden thing. The, 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 the lying price is that the, the bottom line for these three programs that President Biden has proposed, at one of them, which is passed, uh, actually, the COVID emergency bill, uh, this, this is a lying price. It's not $5.7 trillion. It's $17.1 trillion. So it's a, it's a lying price. And as a result of that, the, the taxpayer, the voter, is he, he's seeing a price in the window, but when he walks in the store and actually experiences what's going on, he, he's gonna get clobbered with, with something that, that's you know, three times higher than the advertised price on the window. So as a result, people are, are, are less, concerned, shall we say, because, because the price they see is, is much lower than, than the actual real cost once you include the excess burden. Now that's the same with the, with the debt to GDP as, as it is with the fiscal deficit. The fiscal deficit, we have a, a clear lying price you know, of these government expenditures. We also have a, a lying price in terms of the debt itself, because if you go back to the early work uh, Jim Buchanan did, uh, that there, there was a big debate at one point in public finances, and, and, and especially the, the, the Keynesians had all, all kinds of arguments that, you know, in, in short, don't worry about the debt, <laughs> to, to keep it simple. And, and Buchanan, the early work, I mean, what really made him famous in public finance before he got it really directly, before they invented public choice theory, uh, is the burden of the debt. And, and Buchanan demonstrated that the essentially the classical economists 
and, and people, people like Bastia were right. And that is that the future generations or someone in the future will pay for the debt because they will have to pay taxes to, to either amortize the debt or, 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 and or retire the debt, one, one of the two. So, so this is a lying price in the sense that current participants in, in the democratic process are, are not gonna be the ones paying for this. So, so they're much more relaxed about it because you know, if, if they're gonna pay now and they're gonna ratchet up now and, and I know I'm not gonna have to pay for it. I mean, you know, why not vote for it? I mean, it's no big deal. I'm not gonna pay for it. Well, Buchanan's work all, all indicated that, that that was the case and that the burden where, where it would fall. So it's a very serious ethical problem. I mean, running, running a huge debt like this is, is basically unethical because, because today the voters and the politicians are, are making a determination about the burden and, and they exchange that the, that the people who aren't even born yet are actually going to be mandated to engage in. This, this won't be a free transaction for them. They're, they're, gonna, they're gonna have to pay up whether they like it or not. So th this is a problem with the debt. It, it all goes back to Buchanan actually. Uh, and I can't remember when Jim did the work. He, he was actually still at the University of Virginia. So it was a long time ago. It was, it was I think in the late sixties and early seventies, most of that work that Jim did on public finance. He actually wrote a book, I think called the public finances. I have it down in the office. And Steve don't ask me what the date of publication is on that. <laughs> I, can't, I can't really remember, but, but Buchanan is a guy. If you get into this public debt, He's the he's the one who worked it all out, and uh, and and I, I would say that was the start of a fabulous career, and uh, what which ultimately ended up in a, with a Nobel Prize. But that's another story. Yeah. Uh, one other comment I'll, I'll make about uh, U.S. government debt, and this. I find it uh, interesting that it's almost never discussed by anybody, and that is the U.S. government's um, unfunded payment obligations, which includes uh, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, federal pensions. And uh, there's varying estimates of what that number is, but that seems to be somewhere north of $150 trillion. And <laughs> that, uh, yeah, that, well, that, that, that again, that again is a lying price, you see. It, it's off budget. Yeah. I mean, they're under liability. So all of these things with the government, you, you always have a lying price. You don't have a market. So there is no market price. And any way you cut it, but let's, let's talk about a, 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 you know, a, a, a government highway, going, going a public highway, the, the Beltway. From you, 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 you have to drive. You're down in Arlington. You're driving around in the Beltway, and and massive congestion down there. That's not priced. That that's a lying price. The 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 delay that you and congestion that you have to suffer. I mean, yeah, you have to suffer. It it, it is an opportunity cost. You're you're sitting there on the beltway you know burning up time and gasoline and everything else uh but there there is no price on that no direct price and and you end up with the same thing people complain about you know oh we're running out of water we got a water shortage someplace california has a big water shortage right now why because lying prices, there's not a market clearing price. There, there's not a market for water. If there was a good market for water and good established property rights that, un, that were clear and unambiguous, what, what would happen? Well, the, the, the price would be going up now. And by definition, if you have a market, you can't have a shortage. The market's always an equilibrium. If you have a well-functioning market, it's an equilibrium. So. So there aren't shortages. There can't be by definition. 
Okay, so uh, I think we'll we'll uh, we'll move on to uh, Q and A with our attendees, and I have uh, I have uh, one question right off the bat. This was actually uh, emailed to me yesterday uh, by my good friend and deputy director of our Washington D.C. chapter of the Boston Society, Jim Bond, and. Um, uh, Steve, you might be interested to know that uh, Jim actually works at the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of Boston <laughs> and uh, is uh, actually he's uh, he's going to be retiring from there in August. So uh, anyway, um, Jim is um, a very smart guy who knows his economics and he has the following comment and question for you. Uh, he says, um, my suspicion is that as a result of the big budget deficits that the Federal Reserve is going to put the, metal, put the pedal to the metal on monetary policy, that we are going to see interest rates below the rate of inflation for a long time. Uh, the CPI is above the 90-day Treasury rate for the next 10 years and above the 10-year Treasury, treasury for the next five years. That is a lot of financial repression. This is particularly serious for young people that are starting to invest and small savers. I think that this is not only bad for the economy, it's, but it's, gonna, it's going to increase wealth inequality and lead to broader discord within society. I'd like to ask Professor Hankey about the likelihood of an extended period of financial repression and the likelihood that financial repression will lead to a market crash and or sharp decline in the dollar? If so, what would he recommend that investors do? <laughs> okay, Jim, uh, th th this gets into an interesting thing. Uh, Milton Friedman used to always say, one of the worst indicators of monetary policy stance is interest rates. And if you read the paper today, this again is my 95% rule. All, all the papers are only talking about interest rates. They're not talking about the money supply. The money supply is the only thing that counts. Forget, forget interest rates. As Friedman told us and taught us a long time ago, interest rates are a very bad indicator for the uh, uh, shall we say, temper and tone of, of monetary policy, whether it's loose or whether it's tight. Now, let me, let me explain what this is all about. If, if, the, if the monetary policy loosens up, that, that means the money supply cranks up. What happens? The initial thing is that interest rates do go down. So that, that kind of follows everyone's intuitive knee-jerk reaction. Oh yeah, they, they've loosened up monetary policy. Look, interest rates are going down. And, and as Jim said, you know, they're gonna be, you know, may, maybe implying that they could even be negative or negative certainly in real terms. Uh, but, but what happens if the money supply is goosed and you look at interest rates, and this is why they're a bad indicator for monetary policy and you, you should essentially forget them just look at the money supply, they go down. But then what happens? Pretty soon, remember after the 12 to 24 month lag that I mentioned earlier, inflation kicks in. And when inflation kicks in, and, and Irving Fisher actually, a uh, great American economist of the you know, 19th century, early, early 20th century, Fisher, told us, and all of his empirical work showed that interest rates follow inflation. So you loosen up, you goose the money supply, interest rates go down, and then after 12 or 24 months, inflation starts picking up and interest rates follow inflation. So interest rates are going up. That's, that's what's going to happen. So, and, and, and in terms of the markets, it's obvious. You, Everyone is is bail is into the long bond now, and and the bond markets aren't aren't too. Uh, they 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 think inflation is going to be transitory and temporary, 
but they're going to they're going to be in for a shock because as the real inflation comes in and, and hits us interest rates will go up that means bond prices will go down it also means that the multiples in the stock market are going to go down so 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 eventually as the real inflation kicks in in 20 late 22 23 24 interest rates are going up bond prices are going down stock multiples down and 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 the commodity prices will still be remain strong i mean house prices will remain strong real assets will be strong okay we uh, we have another we have another question here uh from jim lordeman jim is actually the um chapter director for our Nashville, Tennessee chapter of the Bosque Society. Jim, thanks for, for being here. Uh, Jim's question is the Fed- a lot, a lot of Jim's in here. <laughs> this is easy. <laughs> of course, we got two Steve's to start the thing. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, so uh, Jim's question is the Fed rapidly increased M2 in 2008 recession, and we did not get much inflation apparently because interest on excess reserves was set high by the Fed, so banks parked their excess reserves. Will the Fed do the same thing now? Actually, um, uh, Richard Salzman, um, Steve, I'm sure you know Richard Salzman? Yes. He wrote an article on this in, uh, it, it's on the AIER website. I think this was back in February or probably March, maybe around March, she wrote a, an article on this very issue. And uh, Richard was well, saying, sorry? Go ahead, go okay. ahead. So Richard was saying the reason why uh, inflation had not picked up despite all this uh, massive increase in uh, money supply is because of the fact that the banks were not lending any money. They were just keeping all these uh, excess reserves um, you know, sort of just earning interest, not really putting it out into the economy. Now that, and I think that has since changed, but uh, I recall that um, that article by uh, Richard Salzman on that issue. Yeah, well, uh, first, first of all, what, what Jim is, is saying, and, and uh, I, I think by implication, what Richard was writing is, is basically all wrong. Uh, there's an obsession with this excess reserve thing. Forget it. It's it's a it's a it's it's just noise. You have to look at M2 and M4. What was happening? They they weren't growing. They were they, they, what you said is wrong. We had the Great Recession. The Great Recession lasted for a tremendous, a very long time, and it lasted for a long time. And nominal GDP did not grow very fast, and, and inflation was way below the inflation target of two percent, because precisely the money supply was not growing very fast. Now the question is why, and 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 of course most people just get their feet all tangled up and, and have the thing completely wrong. What happened? The Great Recession started. The housing bubble collapsed. And, and of course we had Lee, Lehman went under and, and uh, you know, we, we, we start a financial crisis. And, and at that time, uh, coincidentally, Basel III uh, came into effect, which increased the capital asset ratio for, for banks. And, 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 and of course, to meet the capital asset ratio, that, that was one reason the, the loan credit expansion it wasn't coming out of the banks. But the other thing that was going on is that you had something called a Dodd-Frank bill come in. And Dodd-Frank, remember, was basically an attack on banks and bankers because they, the claim was in Washington, D.C., the narrative was that bankers were evil and, and banks were bad and, and bankers caused the housing bubble and they caused the crisis. So, so to rein them in and put them in a straitjacket, Dodd-Frank was passed. So Basel III and N Dodd-Frank in combination meant that 
bank money, which at the time was about 90% of, of M4, 90% of M4, most money is produced privately by banks, not by the Fed. The elephant in the room are commercial banks. The peanuts, the Fed is peanuts in the whole thing. And what happened? Bank money actually started going down. It was massively pro-cyclical due to these tighter regulations and capital requirements and so forth. So, so the bank money, the elephant in the room starts going down as, as we're going into economic slump, massively pro-cyclical. So the Fed started quantitative easing. They, they did it three times. Fortunately, if, if the Fed had not done quantitative easing and increased the state money component, it, the state money component of broad money went from about 10% to a little over 20% of total broad money. If, if that hadn't happened, we would have had a Great Depression. We would not have had a Great Recession. We would have had a Great Depression. Now, most people, especially hard money types, gold bugs, and so forth, they, they don't understand any of this. They, remember, they said we were going to have a hyperinflation. The first time they did quantitative easing and the balance sheet of the Fed started to increase, oh, we're going to have a hyperinflation. Nonsense. The broad money, M4, was never growing beyond about 5% per annum during that period. It was growing way below the golden growth rate. Remember, I said the golden growth rate more or less around 7%. And, and, and the actual money supply, M4, was, was only growing, you know, four and a half, five percent during during all of this period. So, so that explains why nominal GDP never grew very fast. It explains why the, the real GDP was in a pretty much of a funk. And, and it also explains why inflation was so low. So all of this BS about excess reserves and paying interest on reserves, it, it's just people fooling around and not, not knowing what they're talking about, honestly. It, it's very an, annoying for me uh, to, to watch it because again, 95% of what you read is either wrong or irrelevant. <laughs> and and this, this, is an irre this is a wrong conversation because your first statement that Jim made is wrong. And M2 never was growing very fast. And, and the Saltzman thing was just irrelevant because it, it, because it is irrelevant. It has nothing to do with really what, what was going on. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so, so really, you're saying that M4, so M2 should almost be ignored. You really need to look at M4. Well, M4, I, I, I did say when we started, M4 is the best measure, but M2 was never really growing very fast either. M2 never grew fast, and M4 certainly was not growing fast. And Divisia M4 is what you should be looking at anyway, if you really want to get a, if you want the, the most accurate metric that is related to nominal GDP growth, you look at M4. That's the broadest measure and the, and the most accurate metric. And, 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 and if you don't think it's accurate, think, think Paul Volcker in, in 1981, 82, and so forth. If he would have been, and, 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 and even, even looking at M2, and he was looking at M2, but even look at if he looked at Divisia M2, the the weighted one, it would have it would have shown him that man, he had really slammed on the brakes way too hard, and 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 he would have realized that, and and we would have avoided probably at least one of those recessions, if not both. So what, uh, do you know uh, roughly what M4 has been growing at so over say the past year or so? About the same as M2. Hmm. The, the, the growth rates are, 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 are in fact about, now, now they, they're actually about, about the same. And, and the reason for that, by the way, is that, that interest rates are so low. If, if interest rates were a lot higher, you'd get very different growth rates in M4 and M2. 
Divisia. Divisia as, a, as, ma, as opposed to simple sum measures of M2 and M4. So uh, the term divisia, uh, just so everybody uh, is clear, that, that basically means the weighting of the components. Is that right? Right, right. It's, it's, it gets into a fairly hairy thing. There are very few economists that, that understand and know how to do aggregation theory. As it turns out, there, I don't think there are any at the Fed. Uh, as I say, the, the, the guy is, is Barnett. What William Barnett is, it, he, he's the man. He's the top man in the, in the world on, on aggregation theory. But you get some uh, over, over at the Bureau, Bureau of Labor Statistics, they, they have a few people over there who are quite good at with aggregation theory. But it happens, oddly enough, there are none at the Fed. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so we have another question from an attendee. Uh, this is from Lee Schooland. Um, Lee, thanks so much for attending. Uh, her question is, um, when an old Chinese lady on the street of Beijing says to you, China is much stronger than the US economically because we Chinese are holding a huge, are holding huge amounts of US debt, how, how, how do you respond to that? Uh, well, uh, it, 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 it is a fact, but it's one of those kind of irrelevant facts in, in, in a way. I think the most interesting thing going on in China and, and the reason that they're in a better position than the United States is that uh, they, they have, they're, they're basically following Milton Friedman as monetarist right now. They're, they're the only large economy that, that has embraced orthodox monetarism. And their golden growth rate is a little over 11% uh, uh, M3 growth. And, and they're, they're, they're now growing less than that, but they have been, they have been since 2014, almost right on the target. Now, now they've tightened up because they're trying, they're they're trying to deleverage the economy. So they they have they're, they're they have I, I think an excessively tight monetary policy. But in general, since two thousand and fourteen, they've been hitting the bullseye, and 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 they have until re very recently hit, hit their inflation target at three percent, right on the right on the money. So right right now, China, China I, I, I would say, is practicing the, the, the most stable and orthodox kind of monetary policy in, in, in the world. And, and of course, that's why the yuan, if people want to know, well, why does the yuan see, seem to get so strong? It's because we're, we've been growing our money supply, M2, the last 17 months at, at a little over 20%, and the, and the Chinese have been growing their money supply a, a, little, a little under 10%. So it, do, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that in a relative terms, they're tight and we're loose. And, and, and the yuan is strong relative to the dollar. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, 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 here's a follow-up question from Jim Lordeman. He, um, he just responded to his uh, previous question. Uh, Jim has a follow-up question. Can you comment on El Salvador's making Bitcoin legal tender along with their dollarization that occurred years ago? Yeah, do, uh, so yeah, I can make a lot of comments on that because I was to some extent involved in that dollarization in 2001 in El Salvador. Not as an official, but as, as a friend of and collaborator of Manuel Hines, who had been the finance minister from 1995 to 1999, but he, he was the architect, in fact, of their 2001 dollarization program. Uh, so they're dollarized, like Panama and like Ecuador. So, so now we have a, what I think is a, a completely nutty. Uh, law that's been passed. It's, it actually is a law that will come into effect in September, and that is that 
along with the US dollar, Bitcoin will be legal tender. And, and since we're in the Bastiat society, the, the, the bad part of this is that, that, that it's gonna be forced tender. In other words, it, it's, it isn't just legal tender for settling debts, but it will, will, it will be forced on, on merchants. They will have to accept it. And, and, and that goes beyond even, you know, that, that you know, starts infringing on choice, free choice and choice of currency and so forth. That, that's not even true for most, most legal tender laws do not apply at all to spot transactions. I mean, if a, if a merchant tells you, no, I, I don't want to be paid in dollars, I want you to pay me in peanuts, you, you, you know, if, if you don't have the peanuts, you're not, you're not going to be able to buy the shoes. That's not going to be the case in, in, in Ecuador. If this law actually is implemented, they would have to, the, the shoe merchant would have to take Bitcoins, whether they wanted to or not. They, they couldn't choose. They could choose e either dollars or Bitcoin, but that's it. Okay. Um, I, I think it's a, by the way, I think it's a, it's a very dangerous thing. And I think there's really are some black forces behind it. It's not logical at all. Why, why would any country, if they were dollarized, be adding Bitcoin in, into the picture and forcing people to use Bitcoin People want greenbacks down there. There are only two ATMs that take Bitcoin and spit out dollars and, and it costs you 8% as a transactions cost. So it's very expensive. So it, 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 it's just a naughty idea. So I, I've heard a lot of conflicting uh, opinions about Bitcoin. Uh, you know, some people really believe in it. Some think it's just a, a big scam. Jim, I I've got somebody knocking at my door. Can you carry on while I answer the door? Sure. <laughs> yeah, so my, my question is about Bitcoin and um, the fact that there's really very divergent opinions on Bitcoin. Some people really believe in it. Um, some people don't. Some people believe it's actually... Um, has its real value is actually zero. So uh, wanted to get uh, Dr. Hanke's opinion on that. Uh, we've got about six minutes left to go in, for our event. So if anyone has questions, please feel free to uh, submit any questions that you might have. I just got another one from Lee. Um, thank you, Lee. Yeah. Uh, Thanks. Uh, yeah, so my, uh, what, what I wanted to uh, get your thoughts on, uh, I've just been hearing some wildly divergent opinions about Bitcoin. Some people really believe in it, that it's a wave of the future. Some people believe its real value is zero, that it's just a big scam. So I'm curious, what, what are your thoughts on, what's your opinion on Bitcoin? Well, I, the, the fundamental value of, the, of Bitcoin is almost by definition zero, but, but the objective price in the market is, I, I haven't looked at it today, but uh, it's, it's, it's not zero. <laughs> Um, so, so the objective price is zero. The fundamental, uh, the objective price is whatever it is at some positive level. Um, actually, we, we can find that uh, price of Bitcoin. Uh, price yeah, 30, down $36,349.64. That, that's, that's the objective price in the market. Uh, the fundamental value is, is, is zero. Now, this, this, is, this is, think of it this way. The, the algorithm that, that generates this thing, and, and, and you, you have a lot of Bitcoin evangelicals, and there, there are a lot of libertarians, by the way, that are, 
that are all snowed and taken in by this and uh, who don't really understand what they're talking about. It's, it's, it's a, this is like a religion. Yeah. And, and there's a big aspect of kind of a libertarian religion, uh, evangelical. It's like, re remember the preacher Billy Sunday? If you don't, if you don't remember, it, you know, you, you get a revival, you get in the big tent and you, you have a, you know, we're having a Bostian society meeting. We're in a, <laughs> we're in a revival. <laughs> but, but, but at any rate, the, the, let's get real. The algorithm produces something that is called Bitcoin, and, and its supply function is totally inelastic. It's a vertical supply function of, eventually. It has very little, almost no flexibility in it, or uh, certainly any positive slope. So what happens, it's, its design is, is fatally flawed in the sense that the only way for adjustments to occur in market when subjective demands shift around is, is what? Price. That's the only thing that can change. You have an inelastic supply curve, a vertical supply curve. You've got a negatively sloped demand curve that intersects, so the scissors are, are there. And, and, and the reason it's so volatile, people don't understand, it, it's, it's supply can't adjust to changes in demand. So, so a lot of people think that the fanatics that are, that are involved, they say, oh, this is why the price is going to the moon. It's, it's like having one piece of art, a unique piece of art. It's fixed, the supply is fixed forever. Well, that's great. As long as the demand keeps going up, the price is gonna to go to the moon for that piece of art or for, for Bitcoin. But what happens when the demand dries up and, and taste change, the, the, the price collapses. And in the case of Bitcoin, what's gonna happen, it's a contestable market and there'll be more cryptocurrency entrance into the market that will be superior to Bitcoin. And, and eventually I think the demand will essentially dry up. I mean, now the only real use of Bitcoin is for illegal activity. That, that's how it's actually used. The, the, other, the other part and what, what drives the price, it's a speculative asset, it's not a currency. And, and so the, the, the greater fool's theory is driving the thing. Yeah. I mean, this this Steve buys the, the thing today because he's going to sell it to that Steve down in Arlington tomorrow at a lot higher price. That that's that's what the speculation is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, I think uh, it's actually two fifteen. So we need to wrap things up. I. I wanted to squeeze in one last question because this is a follow-up question from Lee Schoolin. Uh, she's the one that asked the question about the Chinese uh, debt. And I, I think um, Lee is interested in this because she is Chinese. She uh, actually grew up in um, Mao's Cultural Revolution and she's actually been a, a past speaker of mine at the Bastiat Society. Well, so f fortunately she survived. Yes, yes. And uh, so uh, she actually speaks on um, on uh, freedom, you know, the uh, and, and what happened in China under Mao's rule. So anyway, her follow-up question is um, uh, she wants to know uh, how do you respond to the to the old Chinese lady on the street in Beijing uh, because this is the Chinese mentality. And that, and that is the reason most Chinese support the Chinese Communist Party because they believe they're now economically superior to the United States. Well, I mean, uh, uh, you know that num number one, that that's what Chairman C is. That that's that's what the propaganda. And so you can cherry pick all of these metrics and numbers and uh, whether it's their, 
you know, they, they are the leaders in rare earth minerals. There's no question about it. And if you look at China, which I, I've looked at in quite some detail, they, they're the leaders, for example, in metallurgy, mining. And, and, and if you look at their and material sciences. Now, now, why is that? They're the, they're the leader because they've invested a tremendous amount in those areas, whether by accident or wisely, and, and their universities dominate in those fields. And, and they're, they're the only fields that have any kind of international ranking. The Chinese universities are not, are not good by international standards, but they're very good in mining, material science, and metallurgy. Now, now, so if I looked at those areas, I would, I would say, yeah, they, they do dominate. There's no question about it. If you look at the production of magnets, they dominate. If you look at the production of uh, rare earth minerals, they dominate. All, all these fields are all in the realm of mining, metallurgy, and material sciences. Or if you look at the pile of US dollar treasuries that they have. So the, that's, that's a manipulation of grandma in, in China, which is exactly what the chairman wants to do. My uh, view is that I think Dang, in the modern era, it's Dang that, that, that you, we want to look at because who, who has done more for economic freedom probably and, and the reduction of poverty than, than maybe any, anyone in history, it's probably Deng. And Deng's December speech in 1979, when, when you know, okay, they were gonna have socialism with Chinese characteristics or free, put it the other way around, free market with Chinese characteristics, whatever you wanna call it, it's, it's, been, it's been the biggest liberalization program in, in the, probably in the history of man. And so uh, I, I, I would point to that as, as a, a, something that grandma should pay attention to, not these other statistics that Z is putting out. And unfortunately, Z is kind of putting the brakes on Deng. Deng, Deng, Deng has been swept into the dustbin of history. Z wants to become another Mao. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, I think uh, we've run a little bit over, so I think we'll, we'll have to uh, end things now. But uh, Steve, I wanna uh, thank you. Uh, really grateful for your time. I uh, really enjoyed your, uh, all of your expert input on so many, so many um, economic financial issues. And I also wanna thank all of our attendees um, for attending this Boston Society event. And um, so until, then, until our next event, uh, uh, so we'll sign off and uh, have a good rest of the day. Thank you, Steve. Good to see you. Uh, good to see you. Thank you. Okay. Have a good weekend. You too. Thanks.